So yes, um, and uh, so as Josh said, I've got a new book, The Case for Nukes. It's very new. It has now been published for 16 days. Okay, it was published April 3rd. And this is the first public talk I'm giving on the book. Okay, so this won't be as polished as some of my other talks. You know, when I talked about the case of space, I've given a lot of case for space and a lot of case for Mars talks before I talk to you. But this is actually the first public talk on this book anywhere. Okay, so it won't be polished. And I don't have slides, and thank God. But the, um, I don't even have a proper outline, but what I do have is a list of questions. Uh, that people ask relative to this subject. And the, okay, the first question is, uh, why do we need more energy? Well, we need a lot more energy, okay? The primary problem in the world today is poverty, okay? Poverty. Poverty is extremely widespread. To give you a sense of it, okay, the average income in the United States is $50,000 a year. And we have some poverty here, okay? However, the average income on planet Earth is $10,000 a year. So the average person on Earth is actually very poor by American standards, and half the world is below average, okay? If we wanted to raise the current world with its current population to American living standards, which includes a certain amount of poverty, remember, we would have to increase the total energy use of the world five times. And if you take into account population growth and the fact that while we're raising the standard of living of Mexico and Africa and all these places, we'll also want to keep raising the standard of living in the United States, it's probably more like 10 times. Now, and I show this in this book, uh, got a graph, and it shows GDP per capita versus world fuel use, and it is linear, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, and, uh, and it's direct. There's a direct, don't let anybody say there isn't a direct relationship between energy use and standard of living. It's absolutely direct because, and in particular, since the overwhelming source of energy in the world is fossil fuels, is a direct relationship with fossil fuel use. Everything else is just on the margins, okay? And, um, and this is because, okay, everything you use was made e either <laughs> incorporating fossil fuels or through the use of fossil fuels, and it all was transported to you through the use of fossil fuels, uh, and th that's all there is to it. And, okay, now, so CO2 levels in the atmosphere are increasing, that is a fact, okay, and this has resulted in some warming. Now, unfortunately, uh, and there is a problem here, but it's not the problem that people are screaming about, okay? The problem is not warming, okay? There is some warming. The world has warmed one degree centigrade since 1870. Okay, yeah, shocking. And the, um, the, the, which is about the temperature rise that a New Yorker would get if they moved south to, you know, central New Jersey. Okay, and in fact, um, New Yorkers are moving south, but mostly to Florida. Okay, um, th that's how concerned they are about global warming. Okay, in the existential crisis of warming, they want it. Okay, the, um, and so it's really a very modest amount of warming. Now, it, it's real. The, the problem, one problem in, in, that the warmists have in getting uh, a significant number of people to believe them that it's real is they don't present the most compelling evidence. Because the most compelling evidence that global warming is real is the expansion of the growing season. Okay, it, it, since the early uh, 20th century, the growing season in the United States has lengthened by three weeks. Okay, and why don't they talk about that? Well, because it's a good thing, okay? So, <laughs> so, so this, you know, in other words, look, these guys, 
that take these measurements and they say, do you realize that the world's temperature has increased by a hundredth of a degree over the past 17 years? And you say, how do you know that? Where are your thermometers? What, blah, blah, blah. It, 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 it's impossible to take a measurement like that with any degree of precision. In fact, it's impossible to state right now what the average temperature is in Denver to within a tenth of a degree. Because you, I mean, you could get into an argument of where should the thermometers be? Okay, and so forth and so on, and, and this and that. And, and should they be on the ground, six feet above the ground, six feet below the ground? You know, what? Uh, so, but nevertheless, climate has warmed a little bit, and it has been beneficial, modestly. What has been enormously beneficial is, is the energy released by the fossil fuels themselves. Okay, that's been usually beneficial. Now, there is another effect, though, okay, which is easy to measure, uh, which is the CO2 content of the atmosphere. Now, it has gone up from 280 parts per million to 420. That's a 50% increase. That is significant, okay? So that's not like a one degree temperature rise, which is insignificant, okay? So the CO2 is actually going up. Now, what does that mean? Well, it actually has been beneficial on land, and we know this because we have uh, photographs taken from space, NASA orbiters, and the rate of plant growth on land has increased by 20% since 1985. I'm not talking about farm crops. Those have increased a lot more due to agricultural technology. I'm talking about forests, things that are not being helped by farmers. They're just enjoying the CO2, enrichment to the atmosphere, okay? And this is also backed up by laboratory experiments and so forth. So you can do it in controlled or you can just look at the wild and it's there. Okay, however, we have not seen this in the ocean because while the limiting resource for plant growth on land is CO2, the limiting resource for phytoplankton growth is not CO2, it is trace elements in the ocean. And so you get an excess of CO2 that is not being taken up by phytoplankton and that threatens carbonation of the ocean and then that can be detrimental to the formation of uh, shells and so forth of, of various aquatic organisms uh, and including those at the base of the uh, marine food chain. So that's not good. Now, the, now at this point, that has not had a market effect. There, there are some detrimental effects to the ocean going on due to primarily overfishing, uh, but not due to the, the carbon dioxide. But if we were to increase that, not by 50%, but by a factor of five or 10, okay, which is what you would get if you did increase world energy use by a factor of 10 and stayed on fossil fuels, okay, then you, you'd have a problem. So the issue with carbon emissions, there is an issue. It is not a crisis today. Absolutely not, okay? So certainly climate is not a crisis today. But, and the, uh, the idea that we're gonna have net zero by 2050 is categorically absurd. Um, I do not think we will have zero carbon use by the year 2050. I do not even think we'll have the same carbon uses today by 2050. I think we'll probably double by 2050. But we don't wanna double again in 2080 and again, and which by the way is exactly what has happened. The people who affect concern, and I'll say why I say affect um, in shortly, uh, over the carbon use, okay, their program has been, well, we have to stop carbon use, and so through one mechanism or another, we're going to increase the cost of fossil fuels, whether through taxing it or the you know, the various things that they, they have uh, uh, or prevent it from being drilled by blocking pipelines or, you know, there's any number of things you can do to drive up the cost of, of fuel and, and they're trying them. Okay, now this program, well, first of all, in my view, it is unethical, okay, because it is an extremely regressive program. Carbon taxes are the most regressive type of tax there can be. Okay, sales taxes in general are regressive. 
carbon taxes are worse than sales taxes because they don't tax on the basis of price, they tax on the basis of mass. Okay, the amount of, of carbon involved in producing cheap wine is the same as producing expensive wine. The amount of carbon involved in producing and transporting a cheap dress is exactly the same as that involved in a high fashion dress that uh, retails for 10 or 100 times as much. Okay, the, 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 but nevertheless, if you're taxing the carbon, you're taxing them the same even though one costs uh, order of magnitude more than the other. So it's an extremely regressive thing. And if you tax fuel, you're taxing food because a, a major driver of uh, food costs is fuel costs, um, both to actually grow the food and to produce fertilizer involves fossil fuels and to transport the fuel, food and, and so forth. And so this is an extremely regressive program, and in my view, it is unethical. Now, people can, for that reason, um, it's a direct attempt to loot the poor. And carbon taxes are not about weather. Carbon taxes are about money, okay, as all taxes are. Okay, and the, the but n these are uh, directly targeted, uh, greatly disproportionately at the poorest in our society. And it has to be said, I mean, frankly, okay, although they never say it, but I'll say it for them, uh, that given the reality of income distribution in our country and globally, Okay, it is a fact that people of color, on average, have lower income than people who are white. So this is a racist program. That's what it is. Okay, so it's unethical. It's racist. It's reactionary. But while you can debate all those things, the one thing you cannot debate is that it has been wildly unsuccessful. Okay, that is, in 1990 or so, well, in 1990 which is about the time that global warming became an issue that world leaders started to address at various conferences and various international agreements. Okay, between then and now, they said they'd stop carbon growth. It's doubled, <coughs> just as it did between 1960 and 1990, and between 1930 and 1960, and between 1900 and 1930. Okay, despite all the yelling and screaming, okay, it has doubled every 30 years, since 1900, okay? And the reason why is, to get back to what I was saying before, is living standards depend on energy use, and people don't want to be poor, okay? And they'll do a lot of things to try to make themselves not be poor. And even uh, uh, tyrannical governments know they have to accommodate this desire to some extent or another if they wish to retain power, okay? This is the basic deal. and. Um, so this hasn't worked, it's not going to work, okay? So we need vastly more energy, and while we do not need to get rid of the fossil fuels that we're using now, and, and I suspect they'll probably double again before it stabilizes, okay, we can't increase fossil fuel use 10 times over. We have to increase energy production 10 times over, and preferably keep going more than that after that, okay? This is just the near-term program. The Star Trek future involves increasing energy use a thousand times over, okay? Um, and we can, because there's such a thing as nuclear energy. Now, to give you an idea of the amount of energy we're talking about, okay, a piece of nuclear fuel has about 10 million times as much energy per unit mass as oil. Oil, okay, mass for mass. So, by the way, <laughs> these people talk about, we, we need batteries, okay? If you take a battery, a lithium battery or something, okay, you take that, it's mass. Now, of course, it doesn't really have any energy. You can put energy into it by charging it up, okay? <laughs> if, if you had a, 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 a lithium battery that weighed a kilogram and you could put the, a certain amount of energy into it, and take that amount of energy out and did that once a day, it would take 30,000 years before it, well, it doesn't actually produce any energy, but you got as much energy out of it as you would out of a kilogram of uranium. Okay, so the, the best battery in the world is a kilogram of uranium. 
okay, by factors of millions, okay. Now, the, the, and people say, but it's not really a battery. You didn't put the energy into it. Well, so much the better. The lithium battery, you had to put energy into it to get energy out of it. The uranium, the energy is just there, okay. Now, you take, okay, now, nuclear reactors and such are fueled from uranium that is drawn from uh, uranium ore, which is several percent uranium. But if you take granite, like many buildings are built out of, and many mountains are built out of, okay, it's two parts per million uranium and eight parts per million thorium, which can also be used as a nuclear fuel. And basically, a kilogram of granite as a nuclear fuel has as much energy as 100 kilograms of oil. So you're looking at mountains of energy that are over there right now, just to the west of us, and of course in New Hampshire and everywhere else. And it, that is, th there is so much more energy available from nuclear sources, and that's fission, okay? That's the kind of nuclear energy we actually have if we go beyond that to fusion, and I discuss fusion in the book as well, okay? Um, and I think we can have fusion, and I'll get to that. Uh, then uh, a gallon of water has as much energy as 350 gallons of gasoline, okay? So, we're talking about unlimited energy. Now, I've worked most of my career in aerospace, but actually my degree, my PhD, is in nuclear engineering. And the uh, earliest part of my career, I did work in the nuclear stuff, both in the nuclear uh, fission industry and also at Los Alamos. And the the and I had some debates with the Sierra Club. And here are these people, and they say we have to stop uh, our fossil fueled economic growth because okay, so the fossil fuels are going to run out and they're smoking up the air. So well, here's nuclear energy, okay. You'll never run out, and it doesn't make any smoke. I say, we hate that. And I say, well, why do you hate that? And you get, say all kinds of stuff that didn't make sense. And then finally, I realize what is the reason why they hate it. And in fact, they hated it much more than they hated fossil fuels. Much more than they hated fossil fuels, which were smoking up the world and everything. They hate it because it would solve a problem they need to have. Okay. That's why they hate it. That's why it's much worse than coal, because coal doesn't solve the problem they need to have. Coal is part of the problem that they want to have. Now, the, the, okay, they have to have a reason to stop economic growth. And you know, Sierra Club, in the 1960s, uh, was mildly pro-nuclear because it was a kind of um, a thing they could use to say, well, we shouldn't be drilling oil wells because someday we'll have nuclear power. Because nuclear power, w the first civilian nuclear reactor was 1957, but it wasn't yet a major factor. Okay, nuclear power starts really coming on strong in the early 70s. Early 70s starts coming on real strong. In fact, we were getting two orders for major nuclear power plants every month in the early 70s in the United States. Okay, so Sierra Club does double take. And in 1974, they finally decide that they're going to be against nuclear power. And in their initial statement explaining this to their membership, because many of their members thought, well, nuclear power is clean and it doesn't dump, you know, into the atmosphere and everything. Um, so they had to explain it, and they said the reason why we're against nuclear power is because it could encourage excessive economic growth. Okay, that was the reason given. Not that it was more polluting than fossil fuels because they had spent the previous decade telling people don't use fossil fuels, nuclear power is cleaner. They had to have a different reason, and that was it would encourage excessive economic growth. It, and some of you who are as old as me, I'm perhaps a little older than I look, I'm a time traveler, I'm not from this time period. <laughs> Thank God. Um, the, uh, not a native, okay. But the 1972, uh, there was this uh, 
book published called The Limits to Growth by a very prestigious group of people called themselves the Club of Rome, all sorts of real high flyers, uh, corporate presidents, bank presidents, European aristocrats. They say, limits to growth. We've had a lot of growth, you know, since World War II, unprecedented economic growth, okay? And, but there's a limit to this, you know? We're gonna run out of everything by the year 2000. And they could prove it, you see, because they had a computer. A computer at MIT, and they would say, this is the oil reserve, this is how fast we're using oil, do the long division, and computers in 1972 were capable of long division, and the, they say, well, you've got 28 years. There you go. Who can argue with that? And we're gonna run out of copper, we're gonna run out of zinc, we're gonna run out of everything, okay, by the year 2000, or 1999, or in a few cases, 2001. It, you know, you just do the division, it's all gonna be gone. Okay, so we have to stop economic growth, and we have to have appropriate regulations that will stop the creations of new businesses and all this stuff, uh, which was, of course, the point. Now, the so there was a major Malthusian ideological offensive launched in this period, of which that was the most prominent example. Another thing, you may have heard of a book called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. Uh, once again, uh, world's too small for everybody. Um, the, 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 okay, so where, so the Sierra Club comes out against it. And then they say, how are we going to stop this nuclear power? Because it's coming on strong, okay? And, uh, the, and especially in 1974 when the price of oil went up because of the Arab oil embargo, nuclear power became much cheaper than oil generated electricity. 19, early 70s, 20% of American electricity was still generated by burning oil, okay? And the price of oil went full, okay? So the nuclear power plants are gonna take all that. Sierra Club actually got a million dollars from Exxon to do this campaign. But the, um, they say, we're gonna stop them from establishing a nuclear waste disposal facility. And this will create an intractable problem for the industry. Now, the Carter administration was infested with these people. Uh, the, there was a thing called the U.S. Committee for the Club of Rome, and many of the <coughs> bureaucrats in the Carter administration were members of that. Okay, and, and they started, they created a, a very hostile regulatory structure to uh, impede the construction of nuclear power plants. They also canceled plans for nuclear waste reprocessing. They also canceled the plans. There's a very simple way to dispose of nuclear waste, which is you glassify it, and then you put it in stainless steel cans. You take it out into the middle of the ocean, and you drop it into uh, seabed sediments that have been stable for like 100 million years, not going anywhere. So th that was banned. And then instead, they said, well, we're going to store it on land, but they uh, under a mountain in Nevada. Okay. But they put requirements on this that we have to not only ensure that the public today is safe from this nuclear waste, it has to be safe for 10,000 years. Now, it's not clear that our civilization will continue to be here 10,000 years from now, okay? You know, the English language that we speak is only about 800 years old. Uh, the the, the uh, written language of any kind is only about 6,000 years old. Um, the the, the you know, 10,000 years from now, it could be an ice age. So how are the post-ice age nomads wandering uh, what was once America going to be protected from this nuclear waste? We have to have symbolic methods of communication that can get past any language or cognitive barriers created by a change of civilizations. <laughs> okay, so um, they made it impossible. Now, you should know there's no technical problem storing nuclear waste. The nuclear navy s has nuclear waste and they store it in salt caverns in New Mexico because being the navy, they don't have to put up with this shit. They just do it, okay? The, 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 okay, uh, but, and, and the environmentalists don't really care about that because their goal is to shut down the civilian nuclear power industry, okay? The, um, so, they've hung this thing up for uh, decades and decades. And instead, 
force the nuclear industry to store the waste on site at nuclear power plants, which are generally in the suburbs of major metropolitan areas. So can you imagine this? You have these people saying they're concerned about public safety, so let's store the waste in the suburbs instead of under a mountain in Nevada. Okay, the, um, you know, really. Now, the Carter administration set up a regulatory structure to impede the building of nuclear power plants. The first nuclear power plant built in the United States at Chippingport took three years to build. Okay. And in the 60s, there were much larger plants built, and they took four years. Okay. Now it takes 16. Okay. And once again, I've got data in the book, and it shows it. The cost of building a nuclear power plant goes up as the construction time squared, <coughs> literally. Because, well, you'd think well, it should go up linearly with time because you've got the workers standing around and you're paying them on the clock and they're not doing anything. But it's worse than that because what happens is th th you get all the uh, lawyers <laughs> who cost a lot more than plumbers. And the, uh, the longer this thing goes on, the more the lawsuits and, and uh, accrete to the project. And it just becomes, so it's extending in time and it's expanding in the complexity of, of, of trying to get it done. And the, the so <coughs> this is increased by orders of magnitude. Now, how did they do this? They put in place a regulatory structure. And uh, there's a picture of the flow chart in this book. And uh, it, it, it looks like a map of the New York subway system. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been to New York and yeah. looked at the subway map, okay? That's what the flow chart of the things you have to do to build a nuclear power plant in the United States looks like. And the and each of the subway stops have another subway map inside of them. And some of those are pretty intricate, especially the subway map co uh, stop called the Environmental Protection Agency. The, um, although it's not the only one that is a real problem, but it's a pretty important one. EPA will demand that the power plant, okay, first of all, a real environmental protection agency would simply enforce against people who cause environmental damage. Okay, like, you know, if you take a road trip, you don't have to prove to the cops in advance that you're not going to speed. You just go on the trip, and if you speed and they catch you, they give you a ticket. But imagine if not only did you would have to go to the police station and present a plan for your trip and prove that you were going to not speed, but... After you present that plan, the police invite interveners to examine your plan and to enter suits to contest your claims that you won't speed. And then you have to have court hearings with each of these to, to and get a judge and a jury to agree that you're not going to speed, okay? But it gets worse, okay? Because the EPA will even not only demand that you prove to them that you, in advance that you're not going to pollute, and to the satisfaction of uh, many interveners who are hostile to your project, you're not going to do it. Okay, the, they will ask you to prove that your decision to build a nuclear power plant was valid in the first place. Okay, I, imagine you have a piece of land and you say, I'm going to build a log cabin on it. Okay, well, okay, you got to go to the city government and get a permit to build your log cabin. Okay, and so you think, okay, well, I'll present my plans and they'll see that it's going to be safe and it's not going to be a fire problem and this and that. Okay, what if instead, though, the city government could say to you, well, uh, okay, that's interesting, but uh, prove to us that you shouldn't have built a chalet or an A-frame or a Cape Cod or a pet store or a guided missile silo or a zoo, okay? The, 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 the you have to prove that this was the right decision. Now, let's say you actually convince the mayor of that. Now they hold hearings in which people opposed to your project can come in and argue that the mayor's decision in your favor was biased. It was shouldn't have been done. And you now have to go to court and defend your decision in front of a judge and a jury. And let's say you win. They appeal to the next court. That's why it takes 16 years. Okay, it still only takes four years in South Korea or China. 16 years here. Okay, with more experience, the time to build a nuke should have gone down, not up. But the the 
but in fact, it has greatly expanded, and that has greatly expanded the cost. And if we're going to make nuclear power cheap, which it can be, uh, th this has to be radically simplified. Okay, the, you know, <coughs> the fuel cost for nuclear power, which has also been inflated, but is nevertheless is only 5% of the cost of nuclear power. Why is it only 5%? because the cost of construction has been vastly <laughs> expanded, okay? But here's the thing. Given that the fuel cost is only 5%, is one reason why the nuclear industry has not been particularly interested in things like, say, breeder reactors, which can get 100 times as much energy out of a given amount of uranium as a uh, current pressurized water reactor. Okay, now pressurized water reactor still gets a lot of energy, it's a lot of energy in the uranium. But nevertheless, you could get 100 times as much if you made use not just of the U-235, but of the U-238, um, which is the large majority of, of the uranium. And that's why they're not particularly interested in thorium, which is four times more common than uranium, okay, and so forth. Now, this said, <coughs> okay, um, well, the, the Malthusians have been more successful than they really maybe wanted to be in convincing people that climate change was an existential problem, okay? That is, they were not really interested in global warming. In fact, in the 1970s, they were said the problem was global cooling, okay? Global cooling, it's caused by industry, we have to stop economic growth. Now there's global warming, it's caused by industry, we've got to stop economic growth. Problem's always different, the solution's always the same. But the, um, but nevertheless, since they put this thing out there, they've actually convinced a lot of people that this is really a real problem. There's a lot of people out there who think this is a real problem, okay? And they're saying, well then why not use nuclear power? And the, so there actually is a significant faction now, center-left, saying, well, maybe we should have nuclear power. And as a result, there's kind of an opening for this. Um, once again, uh, right solution for the wrong reasons in this case, but nevertheless, it's there. So there have been now uh, a whole raft of entrepreneurial efforts to try to create new kinds of nuclear reactors. Now, you should know that about 90% of all the reactors that exist in the world today are pressurized water reactors modeled on the reactor that Captain Rickover created to run the Nautilus submarine in 1954, which, by the way, also took only three years to build, okay, including the submarine <laughs> as well as the reactor. The, uh, okay, <laughs> the, <laughs> and he took it out to sea trials and in war games it sank the whole U.S. Navy because no one <laughs> But the, <laughs> anyway, so the story, very successful design. Now, there's a reason why the pressurized water reactor is so popular. It's why Rickover chose it in the first place and why there have been over a thousand pressurized water reactors active on land or sea for the past 60 years and not a single person has ever been hurt by a radiological release from any of them, okay? And the reason is this, okay? And, and by the way, th th this book, I talk, a, there's a lot of nuclear engineering you can learn in this book, and I teach it by teaching the history of nuclear power, and I introduce ideas as they were discovered, okay? And the one very important idea, which is actually discovered by Enrico Fermi while he was still in Rome before he emigrated to the United States. They had this experiment, and they didn't even know they were doing fission, but they were, but they were creating neutrons, and some neutron multiplication was occurring. And when they had, the experiment was on a marble table. This is Rome, okay? And they had to move it to a wooden table. And the number of neutrons that they generated increased. So how can that be? We just moved, it's the same experiment. We moved from the marble table to the wooden table. Now we're getting a lot more neutrons, okay? They moved it back to the marble table. The number of neutrons went down. They moved it back. Wood went up, down. It's the same experiment. How's this happening, okay? Because, you know, your first <coughs> inclination is experimental error, but because it doesn't make any sense. But then Fermi realized that for neutrons to create fissions, although he didn't know they were fissions, but nevertheless, uh, 
they have to be slowed down. That is the picture of a chain reaction of neutrons being like really fast bullets busting things up is not correct. Really, they're kind of wandering by nuclei and there are atomic forces that pull them in and they make the nucleus unstable and so it breaks apart. And so the slower they go, the more reactive they are. And here's the thing. If you have a projectile and you throw it against something that's much more massive than it, it'll bounce off and it won't lose that much energy. If on the other hand you throw a ball and you hit another ball of equal mass, they will split the energy equally between them. Okay. So the lighter the nuclei, so for instance hydrogen atoms, which have this one proton as their mass, it's the same as a neutron. Neutron hits that, it's going to lose half its energy. Neutron hits something like calcium, I mean marble is atomic weight 40 or so, it only loses a little bit of energy. So they were being slowed down, or the term that's used is moderated, by collisions with night light elements. Now, so Rickover, okay, in designing the reactor for the Nautilus, used water as both the coolant for the reactor and the moderator. And what this meant, you see, was if the reactor starts to get too hot and the water starts to boil too furiously, now you've got holes in your moderator and its effectiveness as a moderator decreases and that shuts the reaction down. Now the reaction shuts down, the water cools off, becomes a better moderator, the reaction goes up. And actually all this happens within milliseconds so that what you actually see is that the reaction stays flat with just the right amount of power to boil the water a small degree, but not furiously. Okay? And so the faster you pump the water or the slower, that controls the, the amount of fission you get going on. It's absolutely foolproof. You, you cannot have a runaway fission reaction in a pressurized water reactor. It's physically impossible. Okay? You, now you see, Chernobyl was not a water moderated reactor, it was a graphite moderated reactor. And graphite doesn't boil if it gets too hot. So you don't have this extremely strong negative feedback against a runaway chain reaction. And in fact, the Chernobyl reactor had been engineered to have a positive temperature coefficient of reactivity. It was unstable, had to be actively controlled. And furthermore, another defect of the Chernobyl reactor is it didn't have a pr containment vessel. Okay, so what happened was they created a runaway chain reaction. Now, it still wasn't the same as an atomic bomb. To have an atomic bomb, you have to have a chain reaction that can not just run away, but run away so fast that a substantial fraction of the uranium's energy is released before the system disassembles. Okay, because once it disassembles, that also shut down the chain reaction. Okay, and the whole problem in the Manhattan Project was not to get a chain reaction as such, but to get one that would exponentiate so fast that the you'd get a high yield from the uranium before it, the bomb could break apart, okay? So Chernobyl, in other words, to, to, if you want something to explode like a bomb, you gotta design a bomb, okay? The, the, and you gotta work real hard at that too, okay? But Chernobyl, they did have a runaway chain reaction and it released enough energy to break the reactor apart, okay? And there was no containment building and now you got red hot graphite exposed to the Earth's atmosphere, so it catches fire. And now you have the graphite is on fire and there's radioactive waste nucleides in the fuel and they're being foam sent up into the atmosphere. Uh, so the reactor wasn't just unstable, it was flammable. Okay. Um, and then to cap it all, <coughs> the Soviet Union, you know, actually had an extensive civil defense program. Okay. They had anti-radiation pills distributed in depots all over the country but they chose not to give them out because that would admit that something had gone wrong. Now, the, the so, uh, it, well, what can one say? The, 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 the people died at Chernobyl were not victims of nuclear power, the victims of the Soviet Union. The, um, and the, um, but there you go. Now, um, where are we here? Um,
So I, I mentioned, yeah, there's a whole raft of entrepreneurial companies trying to develop new kinds of nuclear reactors. Okay, now I am not in agreement with the people who say, well, we got to get past the pressurized water reactor because it's a 1950s design and that's the problem with the nuclear industry, okay? No. Uh, the pressurized water reactor has been extremely successful. It's like saying we got to get past having wings on airplanes because that's what the Wright brothers used. Okay, the, um, okay, um, the, 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 um, but it, there's no question that there could be more advanced types of reactors. There could be thorium reactors that use a more common element. They could be breeder reactors that get much higher yield. Uh, the, then there's people who simply say, well, we gotta build the reactors in a different way. Instead of a construction project, make this a factory project. So we make the reactors small and they can be produced on assembly lines and then just assembled modular style on site. These are the small modular reactors that some of you may have heard about. So there are ideas like this. And actually, even though um, Elon Musk is not involved in this, and Elon Musk is not involved in nuclear power at all, although he's moderately pro-nuclear personally, but he, he nevertheless, he has no involvement in it. Uh, the success of SpaceX has convinced a lot of money people that the problem with creating new nuclear reactors and also fusion reactors for that matter um, is not technical, it's institutional. That you couldn't expect the Department of Energy to actually create a novel fission reactor. Um, the, 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 I, 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 you know, because it's a bureaucracy. And uh, with fusion, the uh, situation's even worse. It's an international bureaucracy. And the, uh, but so you have entrepreneurial money going into small companies, or relatively small companies, that are trying to create new kinds of fission reactors and fusion reactors, for that matter. Um, and it's very interesting. I think we're gonna get to fusion ignition this decade, not by the big ITER program in France with it's like the United Nations and it's taken 40 years and they still haven't turned the thing on. The, um, but by some of these uh, fusion power startups, some of which have gotten uh, 500, 800 million dollar scale investments and they're not working on five decade timelines, they're working on five year timelines, okay? Uh, so that's something else that's going on. Um, the, now, What's the relationship between nuclear power and war? Okay. Now, of course, nuclear power was born in war. Okay. Uh, it was first used in World War II. It ended World War II. Uh, I, and that was a very controversial decision, more controversial since than it was at the time, I can tell you that. Uh, at the time the bomb was dropped, my father was a sergeant in the United States Army in a unit that was going to take part in the invasion of Japan. Okay, so I'm with Truman. Um, and uh, even if there hadn't been an invasion, which would have involved millions of deaths, the alternative plan of starving Japan into submission through blockade would also have caused millions of deaths. Okay, but nevertheless, sure, they are horrible weapons. Um, but that said, okay, look, science can be applied and it can create systems that give us greater powers to do things of, and all such things can be used for good or for evil, okay? All such things. Uh, knowledge of the germ theory of disease has brought incredible benefits to humanity. It can also be used to create germ warfare, okay? Y y you name it, anything you name can, airplanes, right? Um, all this stuff. Communications. Uh, communications can be used for all sorts of beneficial purposes. They can also enable tyrannies. They can also be used to coordinate armies and military offenses, okay? You name it. But to be specific though, the claim that civilian nuclear reactors can be used to create atom bombs is incorrect. It's technically wrong, okay? Uh, and they are not used for that purpose, okay? And in fact, some of the opposition that Rickover got from the AEC, uh, first with trying to create nuclear submarines and then the civilian nuclear reactors, was because he was 
distracting uranium enrichment facilities from making bombs. Okay. The, um, now, y you, it's true that the same enrichment facilities I that can make nuclear, commercial nuclear fuel, which is typically 3 to 5 percent enriched, can be used to make bomb grade fuel, which is typically 90 percent enriched. Okay. But those are alternative uses for those facilities. Okay. The nuclear reactors, now it's true if you have a fission reactor, the neutrons can be absorbed by uranium-238 and turn into plutonium-239, which is fissile, okay? But in a commercial nuclear reactor, the stuff is left in the reactor for a long period of time, and the Pu-239 absorbs a second neutron and becomes plutonium-240, which ruins it as bomb-grade fuel, okay? The, uh, and uh, in fact, in a commercial nuclear reactor, the Plutonium-240 becomes as much as 26% of the plutonium, and for instance, the U.S. military spec for plutonium-240 has to be less than 1%. Uh, so both the U.S. and the Soviet Union had hundreds of nuclear bombs before either one had a commercial nuclear reactor. You do not need commercial nuclear reactors to make bombs, and they are not used to make bombs, okay? The, now, however, I do believe that we face a threat of war on Earth today, but it's not caused by commercial nuclear reactors. It's caused by the Malthusians. Okay. Because, you see, I, I do believe humanity does face an existential threat today, but it's not climate change, okay? and it's not resource exhaustion. It's not even carbonation of the atmosphere. It's bad ideals. Okay, uh, which are the things that caused the great disasters of the 20th century. And in particular, one bad idea that comes in a multitude of forms. And that bad idea is that there isn't enough for everyone. Okay, and because, and if you accept that, then all nations are fundamentally the enemies of every other nation, all races of every other race, all people of every other people. Every new person's a threat, and the, the human numbers, activities, and liberties must be severely constrained. That all follows from the thesis that there isn't enough to go around, okay? The, um, and that's the threat we face. Uh, I, I happen to know for a fact, because I have spoken to them, that there are people in positions of, of high responsibility in the American national security establishment who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Not because China is fascinated with Taiwan. No. It's more fundamental reason, okay, which is, according to them, look, there's 1.4 billion of them, and if they all start driving cars like us, there isn't going to be enough oil in the world. Okay? So, you can do whatever you want with Taiwan. This problem will still remain. The, 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 uh, and you can bet your bottom dollar they have opposite numbers in Beijing who look at this from the other side of the chessboard and think the same kind of stuff, okay? The, now, in fact, it's not true. It is not true, okay, the anti-Americans say, the Americans, they're 4% of the world, they're using 25% of the world's oil, they're using 25% of everything, okay? They're, they're, they're pigs, they're, they're making everybody else uh, poor. Not true. Okay, actually, we invented the oil industry. If it wasn't for us, no one would have any oil. But the, um, but I it's more than that. I mean, look, why is China, uh, its standard of living has gone up so much in the past 30 years because of inventions like uh, electricity and, you know, uh, to, to iPhones and, and, well, even automobiles and all sorts of stuff that was developed in the West. But why did the West have its renaissance in the first place because of inventions like paper and printing that were invented in China. So it is not true, as for instance Hitler had it, that the human race is nations in a struggle for existence over limited resources. Okay. Rather, the real truth is that the human race is a family of nations, a very disorderly one to be sure, but nevertheless a family of nations that are in a joint project de facto to expand the resources available to humanity because what is and what is not a resource is 
determined by technology, by invention. And the more inventors, the more inventions, and therefore the more resources. That's why there's vastly more resources available per capita now than there were 100 years ago, and uh, vastly more 100 years ago than 1,000 years ago. And the, the, the um, okay, so this is not true, but nevertheless, it appears to be true. And this is the imperative for war. And but on the other hand, if you understand this, if you understand that resources are not finite, and that, I mean, look, nuclear energy, okay, I mentioned the uranium in a block of granite. To an average person, a block of granite doesn't look like it has any energy in it. Okay, right? It doesn't have any energy in it. Okay, and in fact, a hundred years ago, to the average person, a block of uranium wouldn't look like it has any energy in it. It would be a place thing you use to make red paint. Um, the, the, and, you know, uh, 200 years ago, no one had heard of aluminum. Okay? Aluminum was unknown to science until 1820. Okay? The, uh, and if we go back a little further, you know, for 3,000 years, humanity was in the Bronze Age using metals that are collectively are 100 parts per million in the Earth's crust and therefore only available to aristocrats, okay, to make bronze and brass and stuff like that until the kilns got higher enough to make iron, which is not 100 parts per million, but 100,000 parts per million in the Earth's crust. And now you can have metal tools for everybody, okay? So resources are creations of the mind, okay? And in fact, as I think people here would understand, they're the creations of free minds, okay? Free minds, only free minds can create, okay? They're the creation of liberty, okay? Now. So fundamentally, the, the issue isn't nuclear power as such, okay? The, is the issue is freedom. And the Malthusians say freedom is intolerable because there's only so much to go around, and so we've got to control how much everybody gets, okay? Um, nuclear power is, uh, but, but freedom is what produces resources, okay? And nuclear power is simply, simply the most powerful example, uh, a, a dramatic example, of, of how freedom can produce resources that are literally millions of times larger in, in, in their availability than uh, the pre-nuclear resources. Um, and, and, and there it is. And, and so th that's the case for nukes. The case for nukes is the case for liberty. Thanks. So you mentioned anti-nuclear explosion pills. I'm curious how like an oral drug could actually have an anti-nuclear explosion, you know, positive effect, and if they were kind of more like the COVID vaccine or something? No, what they are is um, uh, one of the uh, most dangerous things of uh, immediate products of uh, radioactive fallout is radioactive iodine. And it's dangerous because First of all, it has a short half-life, I think like 11 days or something. Now, short half-life means more active. Things that have long half-lives take a long time to do their thing. Things that have short half-lives are doing it now. Okay, so radioiodine is coming up, and it has a short half-life, which means it's, it's very dangerous now, right now. And you take it up in your thyroid, and it gives you thyroid cancer. If you take iodine pills, then your thyroid doesn't want to take up the radioiodine that you encounter, so it shuts it out. And that's what the uh, iodine pills are for in a, a radiological emergency. And the Soviet Union, which, you know, the United States, their belief on nuclear war was it's going to be mutually assured destruction, and so we won't do anything to try to survive a nuclear war, okay, because we want to convince ourselves that we can't survive. <laughs> Whereas the Soviets had the attitude of, if this is going to be a nuclear war, we want to survive. Um, the, um, so they actually had a very extensive civil defense program um, to actually, uh, their attitude was, if there's going to be a nuclear war, we're going to fight it to win it and therefore try to survive it. And so they had stockpiles of radioiodine all over the place, including near Kiev, and, uh, but they didn't deploy it. 
I gotta go real quick, so I might not even stay here to listen to the answer. But, <laughs> but um, with the Bill Gates being the boogeyman at the moment, uh, why do you think he's? Uh, what do you think about uh, him investing in all these uh, nuclear startups? Well, uh, because Gates is one of these people that has been convinced that climate change is a r existential crisis, and that. But he believes uh, that. Okay, so I, I happen to disagree with him on that, but. He believes that nuclear power could be a solution. I believe that nuclear power is a solution for expanding the world's energy, expanding the world's plenty, so I'm with him there. And he believes that uh, newer and uh, uh, more advanced types of nuclear reactors could help make that happen. Hi. Um, both my grandfathers survived World War II because of the bombs, mm -hmm. and I believe humanity exists today because of the example of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that people uh, around the world saw what nuclear weapons can do. Totally different. What's your opinion about cold fusion? Is it practical? Can it be achieved? Um, I do not think that the cold fusion experiments that were announced in the late 80s really were fusion. Okay. Um, I think they were observing electrochemical phenomena. And um, so they had experimental error. But I do think fusion can be practical. Uh, I, I do think fundamentally the issue with fusion has been um, the, the kind of bureaucratic organizations attempting to do it. Um, I think uh, I was actually involved in the fusion program I I in the 80s and uh, where it took a definite downturn when the uh, national programs, which were competing vigorously with each other and th therefore getting some significant progress, were all collapsed into a single international program, which took all the competitive pressure off of everybody. And uh, in, in fact, the data is in the book. You'll see that the results are going like this, and then it goes like this um, for, for ne next decade. So, um, the the you know in, in up till the mid '80s, we had uh, American, Soviet, European, and Japanese programs actively trying to outdo each other. And then in 1985-86, the bureaucrats in the different programs got together and said, "There's so much pressure here. Why don't we all just get together and work together?" And then. Progress stopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to know what you thought about the country of France and how they have 70% of their power generation coming from nuclear sources. How can that be possible considering the, I guess, Western political ideology against nuclear power? And at the same time, how can those same Western countries support promoting nuclear power in countries like Iran when they've admitted that it's bad or that they think it's bad. Obviously, we, we disagree here. Okay. Um, well, France. Okay. Uh, Charles de Gaulle, um, you know, wanted to reestablish France as a, 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 a serious country, a country that was one of the leaders of the world. Uh, and uh, when nuclear power came along, he said, we got to get on this. And he organized an effective labor industry coalition that included not only his own Gaullist party, which was the dominant center-right party, but left-wing parties, including even the communists, uh, were all for it. And so, yeah, France is 75% nuclear. Um, the, um, meantime, Germany, <laughs> we just had a, a nuclear disaster in Germany this week. They destroyed their nuclear power plants. <laughs> the, 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 um, so, uh, Germans, you know, th they're afflicted with this romantic, back to nature, primitivist <coughs> ideology. Uh, Germany produces five times as much carbon emissions per unit electricity generated as France. Five times. So, here's a country in which you have a very influential Green Party, and the other parties have influential Green factions in them. Uh, so that they come up with this wonderful decision to shut down all their nuclear power plants, which was about 20% of their grid. They turned them all off. And guess what? It turns out that these, uh, you know, wind doesn't blow all the time, and there's this thing called night 
in Germany and also winter. And so this interferes with solar power. And, the, and it, it's a joke. Now, in fact, I, I actually think that the reason for the decision of the Merkel government to destroy Germany's nuclear industry was that they, there were Russian agents of influence in it and they wanted to convert Germany to Russian gas. But that was the real agenda, that basically the reason why Germany shut down its nuclear industry was to help fund Russia's military buildup. The, uh, <laughs> it's true, okay? Um, th that is the thing was so wackadoo. But the thing, they were able to sell it to the Germans, okay, because of this romantic back to nature ideology. And now here's the thing about this. There's nothing more anti-nature than to draw your resources from nature. Okay, you know who saved the whales? Rockefeller, okay, by switching people to petroleum instead of whale oil, okay? The, 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 the whales like us using whale oil, uh, excuse me, they like us using petroleum much better than whale oil. And if trees could think they would like us using <laughs> petroleum or nuclear power much more than burning wood, okay? The, it can, can, you know, even a tree could get that, okay? And you, the Germans are cutting down a lot of forests in Germany to do biomass and here, okay? That is, we are exporting wood to Germany for them to burn, okay? The, 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 and that means cutting down forests, killing animals, all this kind of stuff. When, uh, you know, if you are a friend of nature, you say, let's use nuclear power, because nuclear power draws on a resource that nature does not uh, use. Question. Uh, well, Can you explain um, what uh, the difference is with a breeder reactor? I don't even know what that is. And given that it's 10 times or 100 times better, what are the, what are the cons of using it? Okay. All right. So there. Um, okay. Natural uranium has two isotopes, uranium-235 and 238. The uranium-235 is 0.7%, a little less than 1% of the uranium is 235, and the other 99% is 238. Now, the 235 is fissile. That is, if you, a neutron comes to it, it will make it split, and it will then release two or three neutrons, which can then split another one, and so forth. Okay. The 238, strictly speaking, you can split it, but it generally doesn't happen. And so it, but, so to first approximation, it's not fissile, but it's fertile, which means that if it absorbs a neutron, that is, if a neutron comes to it, instead of splitting it and releasing more neutrons, it just absorbs a neutron. And then after some short-term reactions, it transitions to becoming plutonium-239, okay, which is fissile, okay? Now, if you keep the plutonium-239 there for too long, it can absorb another neutron and become plutonium-240, which is not fissile, and which ruins it as bomb-grade material, okay? But nevertheless, the 239, plutonium 239, is fissile. And it's about as good fuel as uranium 235. So you can actually breed, since each fission event releases between two and three neutrons, say two and a half, uh, you've got, you need one neutron to carry on the chain reaction, but now you've got one and a half neutrons wa wandering around. And if you could use one of them to breed a plutonium, you're actually not only carrying on the chain reaction, you're creating another fissile atom. Y you're creating as much fuel as you're using. Okay, now this doesn't go on indefinitely because you're limited by the amount of uranium-238, but that stuff is 100 times more common than the uh, 235, or actually 140 times more common. And the, so a common reactor, okay, a like a pressurized water reactor, um, it mostly uses the uranium-235 that you have in it. Now, a little bit of plutonium-239 will get bred in it just as a matter of course, and that will be used by that reactor too. 
So at the end of the day, you end up using not just 0.7%, but about 1%. Uh, in other words, you, you get a little extra jazz from the plutonium that you have bred. But you can design a reactor to like not just breed um, some plutonium uh, that gets used up along the way, you know, kind of like a, as it were, a discount coupon gives you a little extra mileage for the fuel. Um, the but to actually breed as much or more plutonium than the uranium that you're using, okay, and that's called a breeder reactor. Now, actually, there's two kinds of breeder reactors, and I discuss them in the book. The most common one that people talk about is the one I just described. There's another one that involves breeding uranium from thorium, okay, uh, and, and that's a different kind of breeder reactor, but it's the same general principle because uh, thorium is very common. Thorium, in fact, it, it, um, it's been used for non-nuclear purposes. If, for instance, it's the thing in the kerosene lantern, the, the mantle uh, is uh, thorium, um, but because um, it's a very good high temperature material. But the um, it's four times uh, more common than uranium, and it all can be bred. Um, but that's what a breeder reactor is. But the thing is, the th reason why breeder reactors have not really taken off is because the fuel cost of a pressurized water reactor is only 5% of the cost. So it's like somebody coming your, to your door and giving you a long lecture on how you can save 30% on your newspaper subscription. And the, the, it's like, well, maybe, but uh, look, I don't have time to listen to this. Goodbye. Now, the the because uh, it, it's just not something that's material to you. Uh, and um, so anyway, that's what a breeder reactor is. Well, uh, the first ones will be more expensive because it's development. But I, I do not believe that in the long term that breeder reactors need to be more expensive than uh, non-breeder reactors. And in fact, I think the thorium breeder, for various reasons that I don't want to go into here, could ultimately be cheaper, significantly cheaper, than a pressurized water reactor. Have you had a chance to look at the Nuclear Now movie that I think is coming yes, out? Yes, I have, sure? as a matter of fact. Think? Okay, and in fact, I'm going to be doing a Q&A at that movie at the Alamo Draft House Theater uh, at the premiere on May 1st. So if you want to hear from me again, I'll be up on the stage answering questions. Uh, the, the, I think overall the movie's pretty good. Now, Oliver Stone, uh, he is, you know, he believes the global warming is an existential crisis and so forth, or at least the movie conveys that point of view, and I don't agree with that. But he does also mention that, and this is where I do agree with him, that we have to increase humanity's uh, energy use many times over, and I believe that that can only be done with nuclear power. Okay, so I'm not in the net zero camp at all, okay, but I think that we, we're going to need to keep using fossil fuels, we may need to double our use of fossil fuels, but I don't want to tenfold our use of fossil fuels. Um, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, what would be, if you know, the, the state here or even another country that is the leading edge and is doing in the right direction even, you know, more than we're doing here? And the second one in terms of, you know, one of the, 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 the responses that you get all the time is that, you know, Chernobyl explodes, everybody dies, it's super unsafe, and so I was wondering with today's standards, what would be the worst case scenario that could happen to a modern nuclear plant? Is, is a new Fukushima still on the table or it's, n it's now the same level of safety of a regular coal plant? I don't think we're there, but w where are we right now? Okay, well first let's talk about the nuclear accidents that have occurred. Okay, first of all, the only nuclear accident that has ever occurred in the United States is Three Mile Island. And this is noteworthy as being the only mega disaster in human history in which not a single person was hurt. Okay, so it's unique. Uh, the, the, the now, what happened at uh, Three Mile Island was known as a meltdown. Okay, now here's the deal. As I explained, a nuclear, a water reactor in tr uh, Three Mile Island was a pressurized water reactor, cannot have a runaway chain reaction. But it can have a meltdown under certain circumstances. 
which is, you see, you can turn a fission reactor off in less than a millisecond. You drop in the control rods, reaction shuts down. If the water was drained out of the reactor, the reactor would shut down. Bang. Okay, just it's like turning off a light bulb. Okay. But the power level would not drop instantly from 100% to zero. Instead, it would drop instantly from 100% to 7% because there is radioactive waste products in the fuel pellets and they are producing energy not through fission but through radioactive decay. So you're going from 100% power to 7% power. And then over the next few hours, you'll get down to 1% power. But in the meantime, you're producing still a significant amount of energy. And if you're not being cooled, it's enough to melt the fuel pellets and their cladding. Okay? And according to the environmentalists, okay, they drilled, dreamed up a scenario. They said, okay, then you, if there's no coolant, it will melt down. And then all this is contained within a steel pressure vessel eight inches thick. It will melt through the pressure vessel. Then it will hit the containment building, which is eight feet thick reinforced concrete steel. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story about that stuff in a minute. But it will melt through that. Okay, and then it will melt through the earth, all the way to the center of the earth. And then, for some reason, it will then go up the other side of the earth and emerge in China. Okay, <laughs> the uh, and this was known as the China Centro. Okay, the uh, and okay in Three Mile Island, due to an operator error, the reactor was drained of its water, and it did melt down. Okay, except it didn't melt through the pressure vessel, the containment building, and the earth to China. Instead, it melted about one inch into the pressure vessel, and it stopped. Okay, the uh, and th there was a little bit of radioiodine vented enough to give the people in the vicinity the same radiation dose that they would have had if they had spent the weekend in Colorado. Okay, because you know we have a higher background radiation here than they do in Pennsylvania. Okay, so that's what happened. So a reactor was destroyed, but there was absolutely no harm to the public or to the reactor operators or to anybody. Okay, the, um, now then there's Chernobyl, which I've already discussed. That was a serious accident. Although even Chernobyl, the uh, effects have been exaggerated. That is, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 people, mostly firefighters, were killed by the, uh, the radiation that went up as the thing burnt, okay, and, and radioactive smoke, and they're right there with the hoses, and they're trying to put this fire out. Okay, but you get a much larger estimate of casualties based on something called the linear no threshold theory or LNT. Okay. Now the linear no threshold theory was created by a guy named Herman Muller, okay, back in the 50s. It was a very interesting character, Herman Muller. Herman Muller was a communist. And by that, I don't mean he was a professor that liked to go hear left-wing folk songs in cafes and pick up radical girls, okay? I mean he knew Stalin, okay, personally, okay? The, uh, and he was also um, a, 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 a eugenicist. And, <laughs> and he actually approached Stalin <laughs> with this plan. He says, look, now you've got socialism. We can improve the human race what you want to do is take just the 1% of the best genetically endowed Soviet men and only they should be allowed to be fathers. And then the next generation will be much better. Okay, now Stalin, who was not without political instincts, realized that there could be a downside to this program. <laughs> okay, so he thought that Mueller was either nuts or a capitalist provocateur and ordered him executed. But Mueller had friends in the NKVD who warned him and so he managed to get out of the country and come to the United States uh, where he was a real scientist. He actually got the Nobel Prize in 1948 for his work with fruit flies. But, the, but he's the one that came up with the linear no threshold theory. Now the linear no threshold theory says that if you have a certain radiation dose that is fatal, Half of that is a 50% chance of dying. 1% of that is a 1% chance of dying, okay? So this is a fallacy, 
Okay, it's like saying, if you drink 100 glasses of wine in one night, that will kill you, then if 100 people each drink one glass of wine in that night, one of them will die. Okay, or if you drink a glass of wine uh, a night for 100 nights, you will die. Okay, it doesn't work that way. The body can repair itself from toxins. Okay, but linear no threshold there. So if you have a situation where the nuclear power plant exposes a very large number of people, millions of people, to a trivial dose of radiation, then you collect those doses and you say, well, this is a total of 4,000 fatal doses, okay? And so 4,000 people died from Chernobyl. We don't know who, but we know that enough radiation was released that 4,000 people would die, okay? Th but there's no evidence really to support that. However, you should know but the amount of people who die from toxins released from burning coal, okay, is about 4,000 a day. Okay, you'd have to have a Chernobyl every day and accept the prognosis of, of, uh, uh, of linear no threshold theory to have an equal casualty rate, okay. But that's Chernobyl. Chernobyl was not a pressurized water reactor. Now, Fukushima was a pressurized water reactor, okay. The but what happened at Fukushima was you had an earthquake and a tidal wave so substantial they completely destroyed the city and 28,000 people were killed by falling buildings and drowning and exposure and uh, all sorts of effects of the earthquake and tidal wave. Not a single person was exposed to a dangerous radiological dose. So here you have a catastrophe so big it destroys your city and the nuclear power plant still doesn't harm anyone. Okay, what harmed people were skyscrapers because they fall and they kill people. Okay, the, um, the, 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 but the nuclear power plants, you couldn't actually get a better advertisement for nuclear safety than Fukushima. Um, the, the now, to try to think of it, okay, oh yeah, gets me back to uh, this thing. And this, by the way, I got from your friend Peter Beckman. Um, the containment buildings that are built around nuclear power plants are based on the constructions the Germans used for submarine pens in World War II. And these submarine pens on the coast of France were exposed to furious Allied bomber attack to try to get at the U-boats. Never did, okay? They resisted that. And the same technology, upgraded slightly, was used to build the containment buildings around American nuclear power plants. So if the 9-11 hijackers, and, and the specification, and this was long before 9-11 that came along, was that they should be able to resist being crashed into by an airliner. Okay. So if the 9-11 hijackers had crashed their planes into the Indian Point power plant instead of the World Trade Center, they would have destroyed the plane, but they wouldn't have harmed the plant. So, you know, if you, if you want to build a nuclear power plant and you're afraid of terrorists or competitors or an ex-spouse or somebody is going to come and crash an airplane into your plant, you just tell them, bring it on. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> okay, um, just bring it on. Let's see you do it. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, okay, if you had terrorists take over the plant, Okay, which would be quite a trick because they're heavily guarded. Okay, uh, but they take it over and they break into it, and they can get in there and they can put explosives on the pressure vessel, shape charge. But I mean, eight-inch thick steel—I mean, that's a lot. Okay, you, the, you know, in in uh, Ukraine, the, the, they've been shelling this plant, the Zaporozhye, uh, and. Uh, nothing's happened so far anyway. I'm not saying that uh, I want to keep doing it and try your luck, but uh, but I if you had terrorists take it over and, and, you know, I guess with sufficient time and uh, explosives, you could blow the thing apart. Um, but still, even then, even if you blew open the containment building and the pressure vessel, the difference between that and Chernobyl is that it's not made of graphite. It, there's nothing there to catch fire to disperse the stuff. 
So you'd have some radiological release, but it wouldn't be at all like Chernobyl where you had a, a bonfire to disperse the stuff for you. Yeah. Oh, well, somebody is... The Give me a C. Give me an H. Yeah, you got it. Second letter. The, um, there's 450 commercial nuclear power plants in the world today. China's planning on building 450 more domestically by the year 2050. And they're rapidly trying to, um, you know, China's out there right now in Africa and, 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 and Latin America financing all sorts of projects, uh, including everything mines, hydroelectric dams, and nuclear power plants, uh, getting everybody in debt to them and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but yes, the, you know, the, the, the thing, Africa in particular, okay, people say, oh, we need power for Africa, and so we'll have village power. Africans aren't interested in village power. African villagers are moving to cities, just like people did in the Industrial Revolution in the advanced sector in the first place. The, the main effect of the Industrial Revolution is to move people from the countryside into cities, and then they need power at scale. What, what so who's got the mic? behind electricity was that th the problem was storage and transportation to get to where it needed to go and how it had to go, like the flow. So what are the um, solutions and um, innovations that are behind that? That Because with our current structure, it's just not going to be able to support that. Well, no, electricity, it's only the um, so-called renewables, which I prefer to call the unreliables. Um, that need uh, energy storage. Uh, both fossil fuels, hydroelectric, and nuclear power plants all produce energy on demand in real time. We don't store the energy from them. We produce it and we use it in real time. Um, the, uh, and so th th that, that's how it's done. Um, it's the, the, the problem with solar energy is obviously it's only available in the daytime and only on days when it's not cloudy or snowing or something. Um, and so you need to, if you wanted to actually power society with solar energy, you'd have to not just during the day produce enough power for the day, you'd have to produce enough power to get you through the night and not just the night, but in fact you need to be storing enough power for three cloudy days in a row or maybe a whole winter. Um, and the and and that gets real expensive real fast. Well, it doesn't go from house to house. It goes from terminals to a bunch of houses. Yeah, but no, but that that's how it is. That's how it's done, and it works. Okay, provided you have a reliable power source that's feeding into the grid. Yeah, you yeah, you you lose some in transmission for sure, uh, but but it's still it it it's look no mechanical system is one hundred percent efficient. Okay, the you know your car engine produces a certain amount of energy and some of it is lost through friction before it's transmitted to the wheels. Okay, the um, I mean, you, you just name it, anything. I mean, even oil, you, to refine it into gasoline, you lose some of the chemical energy that's there. Um, the, the, um, and so, yes, some energy is lost in transmission, and that's why you don't want to, you know, the, the, once again, the people with the unreliable say, what if we had a nationwide grid so if it was sunny anywhere in the United States, you could still get power. We'll just transmit it from Montana to New York. Okay, no, it, you want to be producing the power not too far from where it's going to be used because the further away you are, the more losses you're going to have. Okay, but the losses are tolerable. Sure, sure we're going to move on. Uh, two last questions. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. 
I heard that uh, France uh, handles their waste very differently than uh, other countries. I don't know, something about recycling and that they have so little that it could fit in a, an Olympic-sized pool. I don't know how much rumor is involved in that. And uh, also, there used to be a nuclear power plant here in Colorado that had to close because of problems. And I'm uh, wondering what the problem was. Okay, the power plant here at Fort St. Vrain. Okay, that was a high temperature uh, graphite moderated reactor. Uh, there are points that can be made in favor of such a design. It is more efficient at converting nuclear energy into electricity than a, a water reactor. It operates at a higher temperature, but it's subjected. What? Chernobyl used well, yes, Chernobyl did use graphite, but it's complicated. But the, the Fort St. Frain also had a negative coefficient of reactivity, not as strong as a water moderated reactor does, which is absolutely ironclad. But no, Fort St. Frain could never have been licensed if it had a pos positive coefficient of reactivity, means the hotter it gets, the more it wants to go. Negative is the hotter it gets, the less it wants to go. Okay, so it had a weak negative. The problem with Fort St. Frain was a very high temperature reactor, and it's subjected to materials to. Uh, various uh, stresses and so forth, and overall, it just it was a cranky system. Um, but um, you know, I mean, I think that technology has promise. But once again, is like the water moderated reactor. You say, look, we don't need to be at 700 centigrade. We can be at 320 centigrade and still generate plenty of power. And the steel is fine with 320 centigrade. Okay, and you know, so forth. So. Once again, uh, it was just something that, uh, I mean, wasn't quite ready for prime time. It, it was a good dress rehearsal for a high temperature graphite reactor, but it wasn't quite there. Um, in France, they, they uh, do some waste reprocessing and they do waste storage. Th th there is not a fundamental problem with storage of nuclear waste. Yeah, France does it uh, and the American Navy does it uh, and th it's just the commercial nuclear industry isn't allowed to do it because there are people stopping it from doing it. And there's the people who say there's no way to s dispose of the waste. to be like if they had a law against parking cars, there'd be no way to park cars. Um, uh, hi, I'm a, I'm a nature-loving Luddite, uh, communist, socialist, Marxist, uh, white supremacist, uh, libertarian. Cool. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my problem, well, I hate nuclear power, and I hate it because when it goes bad, it goes bad, really bad, for a long time. And my other problem with it is that I'm old enough to remember that when these guys designed the Chernobyl or the Fukushima or the, they didn't say all the problems that now we know about. They said this is the latest, greatest, safest. Anybody who thinks Anybody who thinks differently is an idiot because we've worked out the science and it's hubris. And so the next, the next level of nu nukes, there will, those will all be unicorns and rainbows until there is a disaster. And then all the brainy guys will come in again and say, oh yeah, but that's because they didn't do X, Y, and Z. But now we've learned that and we can build better smarter, faster ones, and quicker ones. And so uh, I would just, that's why I hate it. All right, well, let me answer your, you. you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, I want to answer you. My question. What, my question is, if we don't go nuclear, if we don't go nuclear, if, if we don't, what can we do instead that might work? Anything or nothing? If we don't go nuclear or fusion, which would be even better, but... The, the human resources will be constrained and billions of people a year will still die of poverty as they do now, okay? The, now, furthermore, I mean, let me get down to it. Once again, Three Mile Island, nobody was hurt, not one person, okay? Fukushima, 28,000 people were killed by the earthquake and the tidal wave, no one from the nuclear plant. Chernobyl, maybe 100 people were killed in uh, the, the firefighters. Okay, now, no, slow down, slow down. In contrast, 
Hydroelectric power. There have been dam breaks that have killed up to 80,000 people. Okay, the, that's hydroelectric power. And that has, no, no, it, 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 oh, okay, hold on. Oh, well, no, I'm not giving you analogies. I'm giving you the direct comparisons here. Okay, no, 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 no. Mike, let him answer, please. you got to let me answer. I, I was completely quiet while you talked. Okay, I, I let you say your piece. You have to let me say my piece. Okay, the, uh, so <laughs> fossil fuel disasters. Are you kidding me? There have been uh, fossil fuel uh, s smoke clouds that have killed tens of thousands of people. Okay, even in London in the 1950s, 5,000 people were killed by uh, uh, toxic emissions from coal-fired power plants. It, you go to Beijing and you walk out the, the door of the airport and you just smell the air, man. Uh, the, 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 it's rich in nitric acid and the, it's estimated that millions of people are killed every year due to pollution from coal-fired power plants. Millions of people. And the, the uh, to say nothing of the coal miners, okay, and of course we've had oil tankers break up, cause ecological disasters. Um, the, 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 uh, do, no one even talks about disposing of the toxic waste from coal-fired power plants because it is m impossible. It's millions of times the volume of, of, of nuclear waste. And even the radioactive waste, the, not just the toxic chemicals like arsenic and so forth, which by the way have an infinite half-life, okay, okay, the, the, uh, but thorium and uranium and, and other things that are going up the stack of a coal-fired power plant is, is uh, more than the waste produced by a nuclear power plant. And th that doesn't even include the toxic waste, which is vastly more. This is by far the cleanest and safest energy source that humanity has ever invented. There have been uh, some thousand pressurized water reactors on land or sea for the past 60 years, and not a single person has ever been hurt by a radiological release from one of them. In contrast, in, in okay, Mike, okay, Mike. in contrast, okay, in contrast to the people killed on uh, oil tankers breaking up and oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, and what was this thing that happened just a couple of years ago with the uh, British Petroleum thing there, and uh, the the massive ecological destruction from oil slicks and so forth. Okay, however, you want to know something? It was worse before we had hydroelectric plants and coal and oil, okay? It was much worse because, in fact, burning wood is far more polluting than burning coal. The, and, you know, one of the biggest health problems in the world today is in the third world, people cooking with wood-fired stoves in their houses and breathing the smoke. Compare that to cooking with electricity in, in your uh, electric range produced by a nuclear power plant that has no emissions at all. That's our talk. Give it up for Robert Zubrin. And get a book. You buy them. I'll sign them. It's 20 bucks, which is like nothing nowadays, given what the dollar is worth. The uh, <laughs>